My name is Mike Edwards and I'm the Director of Service Delivery for the New South Wales Rural Doctors Network, RDN. I have the pleasure of introducing Candice Watkins, who is a clinical audiologist and has extensive experience in providing rehabilitation and diagnostic clinical audiology services in rural, urban and remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. She's been a clinician at Hearing Australia for 10 years with a focus on providing amplification and rehabilitative audiology support to children and adults. Candice drove the development of Hearing Australia's Here for School program, which is an educational and professional development program aimed at supporting schools in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to ensure all students hear as well as possible. She's currently in charge of coordinating, coordinating Hear, Hearing Australia's Tele-FUP program, follow-up program, which is centralised video telehealth follow-up service for remote and regional outreach clients. Welcome Candice. She'll be speaking to this program today. Well, welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to take part in this year's outreach forum. My name is Candice Watkins and I'm an audiologist at Hearing Australia and I'm based in Sydney. I'm also one of the outreach advisors for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services at Hearing Australia. So this year's theme for the forum, Resilience in Healthcare, is a highly relevant topic in the current climate. And I think it's really important that we can use this disruption that we've all been going through to drive improvements in our care delivery systems and look for new ways of working to improve outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. At Hearing Australia, we've utilised telehealth to be able to continue to, to help support our hearing impaired clients during this really challenging time. And I've really been looking forward to sharing information about our existing telehealth program and what we've done to improve and augment this system in light of the pandemic. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are all individually located. I acknowledge and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and all Aboriginal people listening today. So what I'll be covering today is an overview about Hearing Australia and our outreach program and look at all the communities that we visit. And I'm also going to discuss hearing loss amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and have a look at our um, aided hearing aid, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child population. I want to talk a little bit about our telehealth services and um, what this model might look like in the future. So for those who aren't familiar with Hearing Australia, just a brief rundown of who we are. We were established in 1947. We're a government statutory authority under the Hearing Services Act. We're part of the Department of Social Services and we offer services under the Hearing Services Program. And we're the sole provider funded to provide CSO, which is Community Service Obligation Services, to children, adults with complex needs, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. And we provide hearing services for more than 500,000 Australians. And we have over uh, 490 centres nationally. We're also affiliated with the research arm, the National Acoustics Lab. So as mentioned before, we do have a specific client base that we see, and these include veterans and pensioners, children and young people under 26, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands over 50, and NDIS participants aged between 26 to 64. And, and these clients do not have to pay for our services, but we do offer um, any private clients um, the opportunity to see us on a fee-for-service basis. And our services include hearing assessment, rehabilitation and counselling, as well as device fitting and communication training. And in addition to providing services to urban and metro regions, we also have an outreach program. And this sees around 110 audiologists visit over 240 locations around Australia, as you can see on the map. So in New South Wales, where some of you might work, you might recognise us at uh, Lightning Ridge, Dubbo, Condoblin, um, and many other places. And we also visit extremely remote communities around the Northern Territory, Western Australia, and uh, Queensland. So on average, we go to each site about four to five times per year. 
And our outreach program, it really draws on building relationships in community and establishing solid networks with local healthcare services, schools, and aged care facilities. And uh, a large component of our program is the continuity that we have with our clinicians. We, we like to have the same clinician going to each site um, each time to, to maintain those, those relationships. So in our outreach program, we have a very large client base of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and adults. But what do we actually know about hearing loss amongst this population? Well, we know that ear disease is the main driver for hearing loss, and it often starts within the first year of life. It can escape detection because it's often painless and there's a delay in seeking treatment. And if left untreated, it becomes chronic. And I know a lot of you have probably come across this fairly regularly at, at your clinics. 25% of the 10,000 Northern Territory children who had child health checks as part of the anti-emergency response had hearing loss. And in fact, we actually have an over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in our own Hearing Australia aided client database. 4% of Australian children are Aboriginal and about 9% of Australian children who are fitted with hearing aids are Aboriginal, which is quite a large number. And we know that this is most likely due to of chronic middle ear disease and associated hearing loss. So by the time an Aboriginal child reaches 20 years, they're most likely to have spent about 32 months with middle ear disease. And this contrasts with approximately two months for non-Aboriginal children. So it's really important to reflect on the relative impacts that this is going to have on a child's language and learning. So when we talk about middle ear disease, you might ask what's the most appropriate device to fit to these children? And I know a lot of you listening are probably aware of what bone conduction is, but because I do refer to it a lot in this presentation, I thought I would quickly run over um, what a bone conductor is and how it works. And you might have seen them in, with some of your clients. Um, as you can see in the pictures here, we've got a bone conductor in a red headband and we've got a bone conductor fitted in this child's hat. And we fit these devices to anyone who, who can't wear a standard BTE behind the ear hearing aid, usually who has um, a chronic ear infection, otitis media or atresia. And, and usually a con conductive or mixed hearing loss. So how this device works is, as you can see in the red headband, there's a sound processor um, that, that sits against the skull. This picks up sound vibrations from the environment. These are then sent directly through to the bone, to the inner ear, the cochlea, where they're converted into electrical impulses by tiny hair cells inside the cochlea. And then these impulses travel to the brain, allowing the person to perceive sound naturally. So it bypasses anything going on in the middle ear. So given that we visit so many locations around Australia, why did Hearing Australia implement telehealth for our outreach sites? Well, it's really important to to start with some background information. In 2008, we gathered some data um, which showed the age of first fitting for all children fitted with hearing aids. And now we know that ear disease starts within the first year of life, and it's, it's often chronic by the age of two to three. Now, what's interesting with this data is that we can see two things. Firstly, there's a peak in first fittings for all children under the age of one and a secondary peak at the age of six years, which is the blue line. And then there's a very large peak in first fittings for Aboriginal children focused around the six year age mark. And there's no peak under the age of, of one year. And that's the red line. Now this data had a huge impact on how we looked at running our services moving forward because it showed that we were fitting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children a lot later than non-Indigenous children with the majority of these children being fitted at that five to six year age mark. And this was a real concern for us because it meant that many children were missing out on developing crucial speech, language and listening skills, which as we know, occur in the first five years of life. 
So what we needed to do was look at a range of ways of lowering the age of first fitting as early as possible within the first five years. And that's where telehealth came in. So prior to the pandemic, what did we do? Our first project that we started was in 2016 called Telefit, and this involved collaborating with uh, Deadly Years. Now, Deadly Years is a Queensland-based diagnostic team, um, and we still do Telefit with Deadly Years to this day. And Deadly Years visit a variety of communities in the Queensland, Cape York and Gulf, and they regularly refer children to Hearing Australia for hearing aid consideration. Now, what was happening in the past is that sometimes our visit to the community was anywhere from one to three months after that referral had come in and, and sometimes longer. So, you know, this child is then waiting for a very long time to be seen by us for a face-to-face -face visit. So we asked the question, could using a partnership telehealth approach um, allow us to see these not to five year olds earlier and fit these hearing aids at an earlier age? So how did this all work? Well, Deadly Ears are supplied with bone conduction hearing aids by Hearing Australia and are provided with training in how to use them. Deadly Ears will go to the community and they will identify any not to five year olds requiring referral in the usual way. And the children we're looking out for are those that have middle ear pathology that's ongoing for longer than three months and have a hearing loss or a suspected hearing loss. The family is then offered a standard referral or a telehealth appointment the next day with Hearing Australia. And after the child has been referred, Hearing Australia audiologist who's conducting the appointment and the Deadly Ears team have a, a pre-appointment case discussion. Now, a majority of the families do prefer that earlier telehealth appointment rather than waiting for us to come back for our face-to-face -face visit. Uh, the family then returned to their um, appointment with the Deadly Ears audiologist and the Hearing Australia audiologist. Now, Hearing Australia uh, lead the appointment. They talk with the family to discuss how the child is using their hearing at home and they show the family the hearing aid and they try one on the child. The family and Hearing Australia jointly decide whether amplification is the correct option um, and then we discuss battery safety and what to expect next. During the fitting, the Deadly Ears audiologist is the active participant and the hands-on for the fitting. And the child and family will be followed up at our next visit. But if that's longer than two weeks away, we arrange a tele-follow-up appointment with a community hearing helper, which I'm going to go in, into more detail in the next slide. Uh, and what we've seen is that this model has really um, shown a significant increase in early fittings, which is great. Our second telehealth service that we have up and running, which I mentioned just before, is Telefup. This is a centralised video follow-up service for remote and regional outreach clients, and it's designed to strengthen our post-fitting support uh, to improve hearing aid acceptance and outcomes. So once a child is fitted with a hearing aid, they're referred to the Telefup team for a video appointment. And this appointment will happen about two to three weeks post-fitting and it's, it's provided by an audiologist based in any location in Australia. Um, they have the day scheduled to do the telefuck appointments and this audiologist is, is experienced in, in remote work. And the video appointment's really great because it keeps the momentum going for that client to continue to use their hearing aid and it allows the audiologist to provide support to the client and family on, on how to use the device most effectively and often the appointments are also conducted with the child's teacher as well. So we're showing not only the family, but the teacher and the child how to use their hearing aid appropriately. And we found this service is really effective for those children who are in very remote communities where we might only visit about two to three times per year. So it means that they can be seen in a timely manner and they don't have to wait for us to come back for our visit. And it's also encouraged for adults who've just received their hearing aids as well. 
a really great aspect of this service is that we help to um, to build supportive environments for our clients through the recruitment of a hearing helper. And these hearing helpers are nominated by the clients or the family. They can be school-based, someone from the health service. They might be a community member. And they really play a key role in helping the telefuck appointments to happen, but also to provide the continuous support for the person with their new device. So if they are a community member, they might see the child at school or on the street and they can they can talk to them about the hearing aid and encourage hearing aid use. And the role of the hearing helper has really been the key to success of this program because, because of that ongoing support during and after the appointment. And it's often with someone that they know and trust. And we've had some really great feedback from some of our hearing helpers who've been involved so far, which I'm going to show you on the slide here. Um, so you can see these are a couple of um, couple of the feedback that we've had from hearing helpers. The video session was great for Zach as it encouraged him to continue persevering with his aids and gave him useful information on how to access support from Hearing Australia. Uh, being so remote and isolated, it was really good for the family to have that contact with the audiologist in between actual visits to the island. It allowed them to have a say in the challenges for the family and child with the equipment so that things can be put into place when the next visit happens. And then it breaks down medical barriers for the families that being isolated normally presents. We're so happy that our families and communities have the opportunity to have these telling links in between visits. So some really great um, quotes there from some hearing helpers. And, and obviously with, with any service that we're delivering remotely, there are gonna be some challenges and um, based on the feedback we've had, we can see that locating families can be a bit of an issue in some remote communities. Um, there's often transient staff and it can be difficult to coordinate the telefuck bookings, particularly if the audiologist delivering the service is in another state and we have issues with the time differences. Um, other feedback we've had has been surrounding video connections, firewall issues preventing us from connecting. Um, but what we do is we, we send out a survey at the end of each telefuck appointment um, to the hearing helper so that we can continue to monitor the feedback and improve the service. So far this year, so in 2020, we've, um, we've had 50 Aboriginal children fitted for the first time with a hearing aid and so far 35 of those children have had um, a telefuck appointment, which is really great. And we really hope that we can see these numbers continue to increase as we start to go back to the communities to visit. So let's have another look at the hearing aid data and see where we're at since we implemented tele Telefit and Telefar. So the data is showing that we are fitting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children with hearing aids a lot earlier. So nationally, there was a 10% increase in the proportion of children aided before they turned three. And we're seeing a movement towards one in three children fitted with hearing aids before they turn five, compared to one in 10, which was the statistic in 2008. Um, these results are partly due to the implementation of telehealth, as we have seen the outcomes of the telefit and telefat service models, um, that there's been a reduction in waiting times um, and an increase in the number of children receiving their hearing aids before they start school. But it also reflects um, an improvement across the entire referral pathway from primary health to diagnostic hearing services and then on to Hearing Australia. And it shows the importance of really connecting with families of young children through early childhood and primary health. So we can really see these children during the critical period of speech and language development. And we obviously want to keep this up and see more children receiving their hearing aid before age five and hopefully expand this service model to other states and territories. Um, of course, if this is something that you think might be, um, you know, a model that we could do with your service, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this with you. I will be leaving my email at the end of the presentation, so you can contact me that way. So when COVID restrictions came in, it was 
really important for us at Hearing Australia to continue to provide hearing services to our clients in rural and remote locations. So we pretty quickly had to build upon what we'd already developed and move all of our outreach services to telehealth because we could no longer visit. So how do we do this? So the audiologists who normally do the visit looked at their recall list, organised and prioritised clients, and the clients that we've been seeing over the past few months since the um, pandemic have included hearing aid fittings, follow-ups, and priority children who are suspected to have a hearing loss. The audiologist then would touch base with the health service and the school and in urban regions, the Aboriginal Medical Service. And then we would look at who could potentially be a hearing helper for these clients that we want to see. And as I've discussed previously, the hearing helper is, is really the key to setting up the appointment and providing continuous support to the person. And next, the audiologist will coordinate the video platform that will be used for the visit. And most time, this has been Microsoft Teams. We also send out information to the hearing helper about what to expect during the appointment and also provide them with tips to, to give that ongoing support to the client after the appointment. The appointments are normally conducted over a week and the hearing helper comes into the appointment. In a majority of cases, the hearing helper um, has been a health worker at the clinic. So in this picture here, you can see one of our audiologists, Josh, and he's conducting an appointment with one of the health workers um, the child and his father, and this is at Palm Island. And if the clinic has the capabilities to perform otoscopy and tympanometry, um, they will do that. Some clinics have access to audiometers, so they'll do the hearing test as well, but most of the clinics that have been involved so far um, haven't had access to audiometers. So we're really just doing the follow-up fittings um, and discussions with the families. A really great tool we've been able to use over the last few months um, with primary health services is the PLUM. And the PLUM stands for the Parent Evaluated Listening and Understanding Measure. And the HAPS is the Hearing and Talking Scale. Now, these questionnaires have been developed with children in mind who have language and listening problems, and they are fantastic resources to use with families to pick up a hearing or talking problem um, in children as early as possible. They're really, easy to access online and you can get them at hearhappy.now.gov.au. If you are interested in training and, and using these tools, there is an online portal that's being developed. Um, but if you go into the website, you can, you can go into contacts and uh, contact one of us to provide face-to-face -face training if you'd like, um, like that instead, or we could do a video training as well. So the benefit of already having implemented um, telehealth services with deadly ears is that in recent times, when the restrictions came into place, uh, we could join forces again with deadly ears to deliver multidisciplinary ear and hearing health services remotely. So with the, the support of health healthcare workers on the other end of the, in the clinics, we use digital otoscopy and deadly ears conducted remote PC controlled audiology assessments. We sent out bone conductors prior to the appointments and we conducted the fitting component of the appointment. And we also performed the plum and the hats with the clients and families. So since March, we've had 40 shared telehealth appointments with deadly ears. 12 children have already uh, received their hearing aids and have also been seen for a review of their ear health and hearing needs. And 11 children have been fitted with hearing aids, including eight for the first time. So it's it's just so nice to be able to see that our remote children are, are receiving their hearing aids, um, you know, and not having to wait months on end until we can go back into the community to see them. Let's not forget about our adult clients. Many uh, uh, adults were waiting for an appointment uh, for us prior to COVID-19. And luckily we have the capabilities to program hearing aids in an artificial ear. After they're programmed, they're posted out to the health centres in the remote communities. 
And then we can arrange to see these clients via telehealth to fit them with their hearing aids or to follow up. So over the past few months, we've been doing this. Uh, usually a, a, a nurse or a health worker from the clinic participates in the appointment. Um, here is an appointment that one of our audiologists, Claire, did. And you can see the family with, with the nurse there supporting them. Um, the good thing is with, with modern Bluetooth technology, we can actually sync the client's hearing aids with their smartphone and then we can, we can remotely finally tune the hearing aids from our end. So we're able to fit and set these hearing aids up really easily um, remotely, which is great. So if you do ever come across a client um, who does have a hearing aid and is a Hearing Australia client, please let us know if they're having any issues, we can always arrange a telehealth appointment for them. So it's been a busy couple of months since the pandemic started. So since the end of March 2020, we've had 780 appointments delivered via telehealth and 101 health services have been involved in telehealth around the country. Based on audiologist feedback, which has been very positive, there's definitely a sense that this method of service delivery is something we should be looking to continue for the short and long term. So some of the feedback here, being able to provide families with an integrated, coordinated appointment, which is facilitated by a local workforce, is really exciting and has huge potential. There's been a reduction in duplication, consistent messaging, family-centred care, shared decision-making, more involvement from local staff and incidental lo local workforce upskilling. And some of the challenges that we see, um, as with many outreach communities, getting clients into the clinics is not always easy. So we need to be flexible with our availability and not adhere to strict appointment schedules. And there's also a feeling of some audiologists being a little bit overwhelmed by telehealth. We were, they were really, thrown in the deep end, so to speak, when this all happened. So I think we really need a bit more planning and training if we are going to continue this method of service delivery. We've also been doing a couple of other things via video link. One of them is here for school, and this is a, um, a professional development program that we have for teachers, which provides them with various information surrounding hearing loss and how to assist children in the school who have middle ear issues. We usually provide these, these modules face to face, but we've actually been able to deliver them via video link to teachers, which has been really great. And again, this is something that I think we're going to continue to do via video link to schools that are interested. In a similar fashion, we have another um, project that we're currently developing called Hear for Health, where we're doing, we're, we're developing modules for health clinics. And some of the topics include recognizing otitis media, tympanometry training, um, discussing how to refer to Hearing Australia amongst, amongst many other um, topics there. If anyone here is interested in having us deliver some of these modules, again, please let me know via email. So in summary, telehealth has really allowed Hearing Australia to continue um, delivering our services and, and we've seen over 780 telehealth appointments since March. For, a successful, um, for the telehealth to be successful during this time, we know that the main ingredient has been teamwork. So amongst Hearing Australia, the communities involved, the health centres and our partner services. Flexibility is key. We needed to have audiologists who were available at short notice to participate and be willing to coordinate the visits and also have flexibility in their working hours. And we know that hearing helpers have been a major source of support for our clients, not only in helping them attend the appointments, but giving them that ongoing um, encouragement in wearing their devices after the appointment as well. The challenges have really related to technical issues like servers not working. Uh, we are an Australia-wide program, so we're dealing with many online platforms and video platforms. We don't have a central video platform that we can use in each community. Telehealth is also a new way of working for a lot of audiologists, and we moved this way of working very quickly, and there has been in some sense a lack of preparation for that. 
So if we do continue this way of working, we want to provide specific training to our audiologists and allow more time to plan the visit. We want to continue collaborating with diagnostic teams such as Deadly Ears, and we're also looking to expand our telehealth services in collaboration with the NT Hearing Health Program. In future, we really want to look at using telehealth more frequently in remote communities that we might not get to visit as regularly. And of course, we want to continue doing telefit and telefarm um, because we want to ensure our children are being seen in a timely manner after receiving a diagnosis of hearing loss. So what can you do? Um, any, if you've got any questions at all or you're unsure about a referral to Hearing Australia, please contact us. 131797 is our close, you can um, connect to our closest hearing centre. If you think telehealth might fill the need between visits, reach out to us and we can coordinate that with you. We've also got a really good um, sheet called who, when and how to refer to Hearing Australia, which I can send you if you like. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about some of the telehealth services that we have up and running at Hearing Australia and hopefully you can utilise some of the resources that I've explained during the presentation. Please email me at candice.watkins at hearing.com.au if you want to discuss anything or have any questions. Thanks everyone.